full life, you know what, let me take this off. I'm preaching today, I can do it. <laughs> I want to join the party at full life. Guess what, you can by going online, our weekly email update we have. Five questions, very simple five questions. You answer them and you sign up to sit in one of these pods which are spaciously put out. I, it's not even, I think it's like 100 feet between these chairs over here. Uh, you will be safe. We have all the safety protocols, um, uh, making sure we follow uh, uh, all safety protocols. Uh, but we want to encourage you to come to church. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to watch us online. But we want to encourage you to fellowship with us. And speaking of fellowship, uh, just take some time just to wave hello to someone, nod your head. It's so good to see church slowly thawing out and seeing us come together. Um, from our end, please let us know how things are going, uh, whether it's online or in person. Those of you here in person as well, please let us know how we're doing. We want to make sure that we're ministering the best way we can to you uh, in our congregation. And um, we also want to share some uh, updates. Uh, we're basically seeking God's healing for our sister, Diana G., who fell at her work at the VA hospital, and she's been home recovering since March 17th, so that's been almost a month. So she is suffering from bruising pain and a fracture in one of her ribs. So let's please pray for our sister, Diana. We also, uh, with good and happy news, Eric and Sarah are expecting a little one in the month of March. Let's give it up for Eric and Sarah. We're so excited and happy. Uh, we're determined to grow this church one way or another. Amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. So I believe Felix was his newest member. And now we have uh, little baby Chin, who is going to be um, our newest member as well. And so we have a meal sign up. You can, there is a link that you guys can go on um, in your weekly email update. You can sign up to uh, just bless them with a meal as they're just enjoying the blissfulness of being parents. And so please take time to do that. And so uh, we also want to encourage you to sell your tithes offerings. We have, uh, for those of us here, we have an electronic option for you in the back. Also, a place where you can uh, put your tithes and offering envelope in the back as well. Those of you who are online, there are directions in your weekly email update to do that. So at this time, let's just uh, open with a word of prayer, shall we? Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you that we have the privilege and the opportunity to come before your presence, to seek your face, Lord. Lord, I pray that as we have come here to just know more about you, Lord, that you'll continue to speak to our hearts. Holy Spirit, will you continue to work? Holy Spirit, will you continue to minister to us? We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So church, before we get into today's message, I want to invite our dear brother Art to come share a testimony. So let's give it up for Art. This one. Good morning, Full Life. The Holy Spirit is full of surprises. I was praising the Holy Spirit on the way here and the songs about, about the Holy Spirit. And how many of you know this is a Holy Spirit filled church? How do I know? Felix was raising his hand <laughs> during worship. Amen. Well, I, uh, this is completely unplanned, but it's in my heart to share with you here and also online the power of Jesus' healing. Earlier this week, I had some skin issues that really prevented me essentially from walking. It was extremely difficult and painful, even painful at rest in bed. I could not sleep. Of course, I did the right thing medically, but also prayed to God. And God healed me, and I'm here. I'm even jogging up here. So I just want to encourage you. There's healing and power in the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Art. Uh, there are times where you prepare a message, you prepare a sermon, 
And God says, you know what? You are doing this, but I want to speak a word through you. So as I was preparing, I felt God uh, just put in my heart just to steer the wheel somewhere else to take the exit in the last minute. And I really want to share a word with you that I believe my brother Art confirmed when he came up and shared his story, and that is the power of a testimony. Uh, There is something that each and every single one of us, I want to challenge you to do, and that is to grow deeper in your foundation. And the reason why I say deeper in your foundation with God is because if you want to go high, guess what? You have to go deep. See, when you go downtown, and maybe some of you saw the construction of Salesforce Tower, there is nothing sexy about seeing a building's foundation. You always look at the, how high it is going in the sky. You look at the construction. But when you look at the foundation, uh, no one sees the foundation when they see a beautiful building. When they see a skyscraper, uh, no one pays attention to it because you can't see it. But guess what? If you want to go high, what do you have to do, church? You have to go deep. So I want to challenge you with this message, with this sermon, to go deep in your walk with God. Because guess what? Without a foundation, what happens? What's going to happen to the building? It will fall down. And unfortunately, we see that so many times with our young people. We try to put a foundation on having a good time on Friday night or having lots of snacks and lots of pizza. Or we we try to put a foundation on creating a fun atmosphere. And we see so many of our young people falling away. Something I'm so happy Um, Last night, one of our college students, Richard, he texted me and said, hey, Pastor Jonathan, I just want to let you know that this Sunday today in his church in San Diego, that he is getting baptized. And so I am so happy that when when we have a youth ministry that does seek to install a godly foundation, when Richard does get plugged into a church to install a godly foundation that God is continuing to build on our young people. Can we just shout amen for that church? And so if you have... Uh, Richard's contact information, please reach out to him. Tell him congratulations. He's going to be getting baptized today at 2 o'clock. And so we are so excited and happy for what God is doing in our students. So speaking of building a foundation for our young people, as the youth pastor, I want to encourage our parents to continue to build a foundation with your kids. Even with Felix right now, Salome and I, we are busy building a foundation of faith in his life. Though he only understands goo goo gaga, and he some, when we had, try to do our family devotions and pray, he is squirmy. He might be squirmy now, but we try to build that foundation. Something I want to encourage you to do as parents, praying for your children is wonderful. I encourage all parents to do that, but something that can really build a solid foundation is to pray with your children. Read the word with your children. Read a devotional with your son or daughter. If you have any questions of what should I read, where, you know, what resources should I uh, look for, Pastor Jonathan, please come talk to me. I'll be more than happy to direct you to some resources. And so like I said earlier, one of the core elements of a healthy foundation is the power of a testimony. When we were uh, having our staff meeting, this is kind of where this inspiration for this word came from. We were having a staff meeting, and um, as pastors, as staff members, we're talking about what can we do to just build a greater sense of foundation and structure in our young people's lives. And something that we were kind of uh, exploring and talking about is the power of a testimony. There's something so amazing when you share a testimony of what God does in your life. After all, church, that's why we come together. We share stories of what God has done in our life. When my brother Art shares of how God is working in his life, how he ran up those steps like Rocky does in those movies, it builds up faith. He says, you know what? If God can heal my dear brother Art, I know God is a healer. So if we look at the Greek translation of the word testimony, the root word is evidence. You see, because if you share a testimony, you should have evidence of what you're claiming to say. If I share testimony of my strength, then I should have evidence of me doing something only strong people can do. If I share a testimony of my wealth, I should be able to buy something only rich people can buy. And if I can share testimony of God's faithfulness and that he is a miracle worker in my life, then I should be able to share, give evidence that God is a miracle worker in my life. And so uh, God, he can come through all challenging circumstances 
He has a testimony in every test that we go through. And so here are just a few testimonies I want to share with you of God's faithfulness in my life. When I was around, Ryan, how old are you? When I was actually 16, <laughs> around Ryan's age, I went to uh, go to the restroom. And uh, I wasn't feeling well that night. On the way back to bed, I was drinking a glass of water, and I remember waking up the next morning on the ground. I had fainted for some reason, and uh, <laughs> my jaw was hurting. I just basically fell on my jaw. And for about four to five years, I had extreme pain in my right jaw. Anytime I chewed the wrong way or drank the wrong way or uh, yawned a little too big, it was severe pain, horrible. Uh, before I went to college, I was telling my grandparents I had this pain. And they said, come here, we're going to pray. So they took their oil and they prayed. And from that moment, I've never had pain in my jaw again. So I can testify and give evidence that God is a healer in my life. Uh, about, I would say, six months ago, I actually was sitting in a vehicle with our college student, Richard. We had just got back from seeing another student, uh, Jackie, being baptized. And as, as we were sitting in the vehicle, I got a Facebook message from one of my friends. One of my friends uh, basically told me that she said, Jonathan, today I went to church. And I want to give you a background of this friend. Her name is Cindy. And Cindy and I, we go back um, a few years. Uh, she's much older. She's in her 40s, but she has a daughter around my age. We're friends. And uh, Cindy was always a person who was young at heart. Anytime us young people got together, she was always that, that cool mom that would hang out with us. And she dyes her hair purple and blue and all these different colors. And so Cindy, um, I knew that Cindy was basically her belief system was pagan. She was a person who practiced uh, uh, Wiccan ideology. And on her Facebook, she would always uh, put disparaging comments about Christians or saying, you know, uh, making fun of church or making fun of Christians. And I would tell her, you know, you know, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. And she said, that's good for you, but, you know, I, I actually don't like other Christians in my life. And one day, Cindy, she was um, going through some hardship. She got struck by a car traveling 60 miles an hour. She has pictures on her uh, Facebook of her just uh, broken. Her body's broken. Her body's bruised. And um, she ended up losing her home with the medical expenses. And she was homeless for some time. And it got so horrible and so desperate to where she was asking for financial help online. And so Salome and I said, hey, you know, this is a friend of mine. I want to give her something. So we just sent her some money over Venmo, and I said, Cindy, I want you to know that I am praying for you. And she said, thank you, but I appreciate the prayers of all religions. I said, okay, you could have just said thank you, but you had to go there. I said, okay, whatever. And so she messaged me, and she said, Jonathan, I just want to let you know that I went to church. And I heard a sermon, and whatever the pastor spoke, it spoke directly into my heart. And every week she's saying, I'm going to church again, and I'm going to church again, and, and I made a friend at church, and Jonathan, I'm, I'm attending classes, and last week she said, Jonathan, I'm getting baptized. I'm getting plugged in, and Jonathan, I, have a, I feel God is calling me into the ministry. So I can testify and say God can change lives because I have seen God change lives. And so when we come together as a church, we are coming together to share testimonies. Church, I know we, come, we love to come together to visit our friends, to hear a powerful word, but there is an element that we need in our body of Christ, and that is to share the power of a testimony. Can I get an amen? So this morning, we're going to look how the power of testimony inspires people to have hope, to remain faithful, to dream, and to ultimately believe. And... It's because of that seed of belief that God is able to work a miracle in our life. So this morning's sermon is not much of a sermon. I just want to talk to you. And I only have one point. If you're taking notes, it's going to be super easy today. One point, and that is just believe. Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you that we have the power of a testimony to inspire us, to challenge us, to encourage us to grow in you, Lord. Every single person here has a story, has a testimony that they can share, Lord. 
Father God, I pray that you'll give us the boldness, Lord. I pray that you'll give us the inspiration to share what you are doing in our life. Lord, if we feel that we don't have a story to share, Lord, I pray that you will do something in our life to bring a testimony. Lord, I pray that you'll continue to preside over today's service. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. So people believe in all sorts of things today. I said earlier that we're going to be talking about believe. People believe in all sorts of things today. People believe in government, they believe in a good education, people believe in uh, having a well-planned IRA, people believe in, uh, especially coming from an Indian and Asian culture, people believe in a strong culture and the identity and security that it brings, uh, people believe in finances, people even believe in religion. See, people believe in these things because ultimately, what does it do? It brings a sense of stability. It brings a sense of security. But what do you do when, those, when the identity of security and stability and those things are shaken? One thing that I guarantee everyone experienced this past year with COVID was that your belief in what you thought was secure was definitely shaken. It was definitely shaken. So what, what happens when people start to lose trust in these institutions? You see, in Jesus' day, people believed in a few things. People believed in the Roman government. Back then, the Roman government brought stability to the world. It brought a common language. It brought roads, rights for citizens, travel and trade were safe. The people who were the primary target of Jesus' ministry, the Jewish people, they believed and they put their trust in the Jewish tradition and law. It upheld the children of Israel for hundreds of years. It brought identity. It brought security. They put their trust and belief in the Pharisees. A lot of times the Pharisees get a bad rap in the Bible, but there was a time where the Pharisees were the good guys. They were the people advocating for the Jewish self-rule during that time. They were the ones who were fighting for the Jewish identity. And so soon enough, something interrupted people's beliefs in these institutions, and that something ended up turning to be Someone. Jesus enters the picture, and whatever people, people put their belief in is now put into question. In John 11, verse 45 onwards, it says, Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things that Jesus did believed in him. But some went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do for this man who works signs and wonders? If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and the nation. If we jump to verse 53, it says, And then from that day on, they, the Pharisees, plotted to put him to death. So wait a minute. What did Jesus do that was so bad that the Pharisees said, You know what? Now it's time to take Jesus out. The only thing that Jesus did was that people started to put their belief, not in these institutions, they started to put their belief in Jesus. So why did the Jews start believing in him? Before we answer these two questions, we're going to look at something. Number one, people liked Jesus. In fact, uh, in Mark chapter 12, there's a verse and a chapter where the Pharisees say, they say these things about Jesus, that he is honest, not easily influenced, and he teaches the way of God in truth. See, despite there being a Jewish rebellion at the time, Jesus is saying, yes, we're fighting the government of Rome, but guess what? Pay your taxes. What does he say? Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and God what is unto God's. Give to God what is God, but guess what? You have your civic duty. Pay your taxes. That's not what created enemies for Jesus. It was simply because people started to believe in who he claimed he said he was to be. See, the Pharisees were upset because people who once put their faith in their institutions were now putting their faith in Jesus. See, the Pharisees were simply wanting to destroy Jesus because of belief. See, they were fine with the miracles. They were fine with Jesus multiplying the five loaves and two fish and giving people food. They were fine with Jesus uh, maybe flipping the tables. But when it came to people putting their belief in him, that's when they had their problem. So do you know one of Satan's strategies is to stop us from believing in him? 
there's a story I want to share with you. The devil was having his, like how we have our weekly staff meetings, the devil had his staff meeting with his demons, and he's asking, all right, demons, what happened this week on earth? What did you guys do? And then one demon said, I caused an earthquake. One demon said, uh, I made someone eat bat soup. Uh, one demon said, uh, there was a person sitting in church, and um, when the pastor gave the altar call, I told him, just maybe next time. And that person went to church again and again and again. And every time the pastor gave an altar call, I said, maybe next time. And so the devil said, all the demons who cause all the famines in the world and all these things, I want you to give credit to this guy because he stopped this person from believing in Christ. So one thing that the enemy will do is that he will try to stop us as hard as he can from believing in who Jesus is. So even in today's world, people are fine knowing who Jesus is as a person. People are fine knowing who he is as a moral teacher. People are fine knowing him as a historical figure. But when you start to put your belief in who Jesus is and who he claimed to be, that's when we can start running into some issues. And so believe and knowing are two different things. See, there are people in India who know who Jesus is. They will accept him as one of the many gods that they worship. There are people in Islam who know who Jesus is or believe in him just as a prophet, referred to as Issa. There are people, um, certain Jewish sects, who know who Jesus is and believe him as a good rabbi. There are people who believe in him as a good teacher. But when you believe in him as the son of God, that's when things change. So the enemy's only goal is to stop us from believing. And again, as Christians, after all, who are we called? There's a word that describes us. Can someone help me out? What are we described as? We are described as believers, believers in Jesus. So again, if belief was simply about believing in God's existence, Satan himself would be saved. But there's a difference between believing and then believing, you know, Jesus is just a person, then believing in who he claimed to be. And so many of you know the story, but some of us who are unfamiliar, I want us to turn to John chapter 11. We're going to be looking at a few key verses to understand the story, and we're going to hop around this passage. It says in verse 1, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, and whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. The Bible then says that Jesus heard the news and stayed two more days. Then he and his disciples made their way to Lazarus' town. My translation basically says that Jesus was around two miles away from where Lazarus was. When we read this passage, you might think that Jesus was, you know, far away and it was a long journey there. No, just two miles. Most of us are going to be walking around two miles today. So it wasn't like Jesus was far away from Lazarus. He was very capable of going and meeting Lazarus the very same day he got this message. Verse 11 through 15, it says, And after he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, But I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought he was speaking about taking Lazarus' rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. In this chapter, there is one word that Jesus repeats six times, and that is, Believe. In this chapter, Jesus is trying to emphasize the power of what a testimony can do to encourage us to believe. Jesus finishes and says, nevertheless, let us go to him. See, we often think that Jesus walked around with just 12 guys. Jesus was popular. He had a huge following. You see, Jesus was a celebrity. Mary and Martha, they were not just fans of Jesus. They were close friends with Jesus. See, when you are friends with a celebrity, you get certain perks. One of my mom's uh, roommates in college, 
Uh, she is a famous Christian singer. Her name is Nicole C. Mullen. About 20 years ago, she had a very popular song that won like the, like the song of the year within the Christian charts. And uh, when she would have concerts with all these other uh, artists, like this is a little bit old school. Some of you might not remember them or even know who I'm talking about, but like DC Talk, Newsboys, Carmen, all these people, she would sing with them and we would go see her, her concerts. Guess what? We would get perks. We would get backstage passes. We would get to meet all these people and be in the green room and eat all their snacks and food and get autographs. And so Mary and Martha and Lazarus, they weren't just fans of Jesus. They were not just people who knew about Jesus. They were family with Jesus. They were close friends. Of all people, if Jesus is going to heal someone, he should be healing the people closest to him. They don't have to wait in line for Jesus to heal him. They can say, Jesus, my brother, come on. Stretch your hands. Give me some healing. But here's the thing. Jesus waited. See, the sad thing is that Jesus eventually says, guess what? Lazarus is dead. See, there are sometimes bad things that happen to good people. Sometimes we ask, why do good things happen to bad people? But a lot of times, bad things happen to good people. You see, Mary and Martha, they didn't just like Jesus. They, in their own sense, believed in certain things about who Jesus was. They believed that he was the Messiah. They believed that uh, he does miracles. But if there was one thing that they lacked is that they didn't believe that Jesus can raise their brother from the dead. See, problems still come. As believers, we need to understand that the Bible says in Proverbs that it rains on the just and the unjust, meaning problems happen. Believing does not exempt you from problems. Just because you say, I'm going to put my belief in Christ, guess what? You are still going to have problems. Can I get, by a show of hands, people who have problems? Every, Felix is raising his hand as well. Everyone has problems in this world. But see, problems are not an indictment against your intensity in your belief in God. I'm going to say that one more time. Problems are not an indictment against your intensity in your belief in God. We all have problems that we deal with. But guess what? That doesn't mean that your belief in God is diminished. See, being a believer will often reveal problems that you thought you never had. Verse 17 through 27, it says, So when Jesus came, he found that he had recently been in the tomb for four days. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. See, death of a loved one is never easy because it is a permanent goodbye. Recently, my dad shared some news with me that a dear family friend passed away yesterday. And it's very sad because you, you, you're never going to see this person again. The only thing that you have is memories. The only thing you have are the good times. And so when Mary and Martha lost their brother Lazarus, this was a permanent goodbye. They didn't have photos. They didn't have videos on their cell phone. Lazarus was gone. He was gone. And it was almost a permanent goodbye because he has been dead for four days. They put him in the tomb. Jesus wasn't there. He didn't even make the funeral. Lazarus was gone, and he wasn't coming back. See, a lot of times we say, just what uh, Mary and Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, maybe you could have healed my brother. We say, Lord, if you could have been here, maybe my marriage would have been saved. Lord, if you could have been here, maybe my child would have, been, uh, would have still been a believer. Lord, if you had just come a little bit earlier, maybe you would have saved me from this predicament that I am in. Jesus continues to say in verse 33 through 36, Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came to her with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and he said, Where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. And that some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind have also kept this man from dying? 
So in Mary and Martha's pain, Jesus was silent. See, in their mind, they knew that Jesus could one day resurrect Jesus and the, uh, resurrect Lazarus in the resurrection when all believers are going to come alive. But in this moment, they had their doubts. And as they prayed and as they wept, it says, Jesus was silent. Have you ever felt like God had his phone on silence, anyone? You call, you pray, you text, you FaceTime, you WhatsApp, you TikTok, no response. So Jesus sometimes can be silent. And something that I've experienced in my own life is when this verse so eloquently says, Jesus wept. When I was a kid and my parents would ask us, okay, you know, did you memorize a Bible verse? We said, yes. What did you memorize? This, this verse, Jesus wept. If you don't know, it's the shortest verse in the Bible. That's why we memorized it. And then my parents will pull a trump card and they'll say, okay, I want you to memorize Psalms 119. If you don't know what that is, that is the longest chapter in the Bible. It's a few pages. And so Jesus weeps how eloquently. He doesn't need to speak. He just needs to weep to understand our pain. Something that is very important when someone is going through hardships and troubles. Yes, it's great that we can cheer them up. Yes, it's great that we can try to uplift their countenance. But sometimes when people are sad, learn to be sad with them. Learn to understand their pain. I know when I have cried in my own life, when I have gone through pain and circumstances, I just wanted someone to understand my predicament. I just wanted someone to weep with me. And I'm so glad that God is God who weeps with us. I truly believe when God sometimes seems silent, it is because he is weeping with us. So here's the thing. Sometimes we can fall in the trap of letting our emotions control what we believe about God. See, Mary and Martha were allowing their emotions of grief and sadness, which were totally justified, to control what they believed about what Jesus could do. They said, Jesus, we believe that you will raise Lazarus eventually one day. A lot of times, we as believers dictate our belief by emotions. I know a lot of times being in a Pentecostal charismatic church when emotions are so heavily involved, and that's wonderful, sometimes we can fall in the trap of letting our emotions dictate our theology and belief about God. See, we have to remember that believing is a choice and not a feeling. We need to say in the midst of the circumstance, in the midst of the doubt, in the midst of the problems that, you know what, I am going to believe what God said he is going to do. The Bible says, yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow and death, I will fear no evil. Yes, death is there. Yes, I am walking in the shadow, but I believe I will walk with God by, behind my back. And so, again, we often allow our emotions to dictate our approach to our spiritual life. But guess what? God sees the past, he is seeing the present, and he sees the future. So we need to believe as a choice that God can do what he says he can do. So Jesus says, show me where you have laid him. In other words, show me where you gave up. Show me where you said you threw in the towel. Show me where you have decided to stop believing. This morning, I want to ask you, show me where you have given up on that problem. Show me when you have, where you have given up on that person. Show me where you've given up on that situation. Maybe God was, you know, gave a, a, a promise in your life. God gave a blessing in your life. God gave a person in your life, and you are just giving up. God this morning is going to say, show me where you gave up so you can believe. Verse 38 to 40, it says, Then Jesus, Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would just believe, you would see the glory of God? See, guess what? God's silence only lasts for a moment. He isn't silent forever. Praise God. Uh, this, see, this tragedy is now being transformed into a miracle simply because these two sisters are starting to believe. When Jesus said, take me to the place where you have laid him, 
and roll away that stone, they could have stopped Jesus and said, Jesus, please, we are hurting. Please stop adding humiliation to this pain. But they said, something in my life is going to believe. There is something each and every single one of us has to do to stretch our faith and say, God, I want to believe. Can we tap our neighbor, if you're sitting next to a neighbor, and say, I want to believe. Those who are watching online, I want you to slap your neighbor and say, I want to believe. Holy Spirit, this morning, I want to believe as well. I want to take you to the place where I gave up. I want to take you to the place where I've given up hope, and I want to believe. James chapter 2, uh, verses four, 14, it says, Faith without action is dead. Faith without action is dead. You have to believe and put your faith into motion. You're going to have to find some stones to remove. Jesus said, remove the stone. It takes an act of faith to remove that stone covering that miracle that's on the other side. See, people's belief hinged on that stone being rolled away. See, you need to surround yourself with people who can remove the stones in your life. That's why community is so important in this church. When we have life group, when we have Elam and Impact and uh, Lord willing, as we are um, starting and we are developing our college ministry, as we have the prayer and Bible study happening, that is us coming together to roll away the stones in our life. When we hear Brother Art share of what God is doing in his life, guess what? Art is rolling away the stone for some of the doubt that we have covering up our belief. So when, when we come together as a church, we are rolling away the stones when we share testimonies, when we hear of God's faithfulness, when we hear what God can do, we are rolling away stones. Anyone listen to Rolling Stones? Maybe, maybe Pastor, you listen to Rolling Stones? Those were the days. So, who, maybe, who knows? That's where they got the name from. So there's a stone stopping your miracle. There's a stone hindering your belief. Find a stone and roll it away. Verse 43 verse through 44, it says, Now when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice and said, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Loose him and let it go. I imagine, again, it says he was bound hand and foot, Lazarus hopping out of the grave, saying, Where am I? What's going on? Thank God that with the power of belief that Mary and Martha had, Lazarus was able to come out of the grave. Amen. And so, again, once and for all, with this miracle, Jesus established that death is dead if we can believe. Some of us have a stone that we need to remove. Find people that can help you remove that stone. Some of you might right, uh, right now might not have a stone to remove. I want you to look for someone whose stone you can remove. Be that person who can build a belief. See, this is, this is so important because the verse says, and then people believed in Jesus. It was the power of this testimony of seeing what God can do that caused people to believe in him. They believed that Jesus can raise people from the dead because he displayed the evidence for it in this passage. See, if we declare that God is a miracle worker, that God can transform lives, it is up to us, church, to display that evidence. I want to encourage you to find areas where you had given up, where you had laid a Lazarus in your life to rest, and roll that stone away so God can do a transformative miracle. But here's the thing about belief. As we're looking at belief, we also need to understand not the power of, that the, the belief has power, but also Unbelief also has power as well. Did you know that? Matthew 15, 38, it says, Jesus did not do many miracles there, there being where he grew up. Jesus was doing a mission trip, ministering all over Judea, but when he came to his own town, it says, he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. See, they only knew Jesus as the little boy that grew up with his family fixing their household carpentry needs. They only believed Jesus uh, could be a good carpenter. But believing he's the son of God, maybe that was too big of a stretch. Sometimes we can get so cattle with God that we believe that, again, Jesus is just a good person. 
He is uh, just a person who is a good moral teacher. But I want to encourage you to stretch your faith and believe that he is the son of God. He is the miracle worker. He is a God who can roll away the stones and speak life in these situations. And so the power of a testimony can transform your life. Every single one of us has a story that we can tell that can bring an inspiration and a transformative power if we just stretch our faith, believe, and share that testimony. This morning, church, I want to encourage you to look in your life and see where is God having a testimony in my life? Where is God creating a story for me to share? It is so important, church, that we come together and talk about what God is doing in our life. Please talk to Pastor Daniel. Those of you who are watching online, please, uh, if God has put a word in your heart, please talk to Pastor Daniel, uh, talk to Pastor Sifa, and I want us to come together and share what God is doing in our life because I truly believe when we come together and we show what God is doing, when we give evidence of him being a miracle worker in our life, something powerful can happen. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this morning. Lord, I thank you that we have a word that we can know that, God, you are a miracle worker. Lord, I thank you that we can give evidence and testimony that you are a God who changes lives. You are a God who can transform situations. You are a God who can change this world upside down. Holy Spirit, right now I pray that as we maybe look in our life, Lord, for a testimony or we remember the testimonies that we have heard of how you have worked in other people's lives. Holy Spirit, right now, I pray that you will inspire belief. Help us to believe, Lord. Help us to build our bedrock on the belief of you. God, right now, I just pray for our dear brothers and sisters. Lord, I pray, Lord, that this morning, as you are imparting a word in their life, as you are imparting a testimony, as you are sending someone to maybe roll that stone away, or you're sending them to roll that stone away in someone else's life. God, I pray that you will continue to work on their behalf. Holy Spirit, we ask that you'll continue to bless this church, Lord, as we are instrumental in rolling away the stones in this community, Lord, in, in encouraging belief in who you are. Lord, I pray that you'll give us the strength, give us the insight, give us the fortitude to continue being a lighthouse in this city. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Church, thank you so much for coming. Um, I just want to encourage you to continue to pray. Let's believe God. Um, I was speaking with um, one of our other young adults yesterday, and I, want you to, I just want to encourage you. God is doing something within our young adult's life. I want to encourage you to build that faith in their life. Speak to them. If you have a son or a daughter who is a college student or a young adult, continue to encourage them, continue to pray for them. And also, I want to ask you to, to encourage them to get involved. Uh, many times I speak with them, and we have um, our gatherings and get-togethers. Please can encourage them to participate. I know many of you do. And let's continue to pray for our young adults, can we? Amen. So I love you guys. It's good seeing you. Uh, enjoy today's beautiful weather. And if you are one of our youth or young adults, come talk to me afterwards. We're going to have a hangout planned after church, and I'll see you guys hopefully next week.